Hello and welcome. Today I'd like to take a look at this old AT&T Office PC and see if I can do a retro gaming machine out of it. It came to me with this very dirty cherry keyboard, which I also have to take care of. So, let's start. The machine is AT&T Globalis 515, a quite normal Office PC back in the days. As far as I know, this must be some weak 486 machine. The Intel Inside sticker tells a little bit about what we should expect inside. The case is in pretty good condition. The 5 and quarter inch bay is empty. There are some minus scratches on the top and missing screws, so the cover is just lying loosely on the case. It has an interesting power switch with two buttons, which should prevent accidental power switching by the user. You have to press the main button once and then the second button on the side of the case to turn off the PC. Okay, what else do we have? Here is a key lock, probably to prevent from unwanted case intrusion. And on the back? It seems to have a usual PSU, and here we have a VGA port, the parallel port and two serial ports, PS2 mouse and PS2 keyboard ports. The sign for the mouse port is quite funny and should prevent any misunderstanding. On the left side there is nothing special, just some ventilation holes. And we are back at the front. Now let's take a look inside. Here is the lock and indeed it looks to be just a mechanical intrusion protection. This looks like a hard drive folder. The hard drive itself obviously seems to be missing. But luckily the previous owner left the holder inside. This is the graphics chip. Cyrus Logic CLGD5429. Mm, interesting. And here is the BIOS flash ROM. Everything is quite dusty inside, but this is a good sign, means a good chance that everything here is still in original state. There is something about this VGA chip. The 5429 is actually a Vessel Local bus chip, but I can only see ISO slots here. I'm curious if the onboard VGA adapter is bound over VLB to the CPU. This would be great in case of performance. Also on the back side of the riser card is only one ISO slot. Hmm. Let's take out the CPU and see what we have here. The CPU cooler is sitting very loosely. I guess either the CPU or the cooler must be not original anymore. Okay, and the CPU is an Intel 486SX33. If my information is correct, this machine should originally have had 486SX25 CPU. So probably there was kind of upgrade in the past. This PC has two memory modules with an 8 written on each one. I didn't check the IDs, but I guess this means 8 MB each and we have here 16 MB altogether. I definitely assume this is an upgrade since 16 MB is actually too much for the age of this machine. And here is the mainboard itself. The first thing I see is that the Razer card is proprietary. It doesn't have a break between 8 and 16 bits parts, like an ISO slot would have. Ok, here is the IDE connector, this is for the floppy drive, here we have a normal AT power connector, the CPU socket and here is something interesting. This slot, which looks like a part of a VLB slot, I guess this must be for the CPU cache extension card. There seem to be no cache chips on the board. And this slot is not populated. I guess, unfortunately, this mainboard doesn't have any second level cache installed. That's a shame. And here again the VGA chip by Cyrus Logic. I'm really curious if this is using ISA or VLB bus. For gaming it would be great if it were to use VLB. This whole part here is related to the onboard graphics adapter. Here are the memory chips, I would say, each 512K makes 1 MB of medium memory altogether. If the graphics adapter is wired through VLB to the CPU, we'd still have enough performance in the games, even if second level cache is missing. The bus of the graphics adapter is definitely more important. To get the power supply unit out of the case, we have to remove the PC speaker, which is held on the bottom of the case by a screw underneath. In 
Unfortunately, some standoffs on the front panel are broken. Here another one. And here are the internals of the power switch. Every time you press the main button to turn off the PC, it is hauled back by a spring. If you press the button on the side, the spring goes back and releases the main power button. Here inside, unfortunately, I found another broken standoff. I have to get all the plastic parts of the case to wash them, even the front panel of the floppy drive. Fortunately, there is no need to retro drive the parts. They don't look too bad. So washing everything with some breath, soap and water should be sufficient. The main board goes into soapy bath as well. Oops, forgot to take out the battery. Let's get the hands on this crusty keyboard. The top part is very dirty and disgusting, however, inside it looks quite clean. Just a little bit of dust on the membrane. So I will not wash it, just remove the dust. Buttons were soaking in the soapy water for about an hour. After that I washed them with clean water a couple of times and left drying in the sun. I used some silicon grease for supporters under the bigger buttons like spacebar. is shiny and as good as new. The power supply unit looks good. No blown capacitors or any damage to see. Just a bit dusty. The fan seems to be okay, but a little bit of service and oil will help to run for another 20 years. Let's check the voltages. Hmm. The fan doesn't seem to blow any air. The 5 volt rail seem to go crazy as well, pending somewhere between 4 and 5 volts. This can happen without a load. I'll connect the hard drive to get some load on the PCU.
Now we have stable 4.9 volts. Not 5 volts, but good enough. And the fan is blowing as well. Other voltages. Minus 12 volt, 12 volt, minus 5 volt. Looks good. The floppy drive looks extremely clean inside. Anyway, I'll clean the heads with some alcohol and put some fresh silicon grease on the rails. On the front panel there is just slightly yellowing, but not worth to do the retrobriting. Watching the mainboard, I took a closer look. You can see hard patches everywhere, workarounds all over the place. But this kind of factory-made fixes were quite common back in the days. Now I'll install the same CPU as before, just for testing. And if everything is fine, I'll try to install something beefier later. PC speaker is an important helper for post-errors analysis, so always connect it as early as possible. I'll also add all the drives now. Maybe we will be ready to boot into DOS already. This is original Mitsumi quad-speed CD-ROM drive. It looks ugly because the cover had some rust before. However, it is technically in top condition. I refurbished it some time ago. I will install the same 16 MB of memory, which were previously installed in this PC. Time for the first run. And the PC posted instantly. That's nice. However, it shows only 8 MB of RAM. This is odd. I expect it to be 16. Okay, once in BIOS, you can see here that it also shows only 8 MB of extended memory. Let's take a closer look. Okay, these are the two memory modules, each with 8 MB. They are both working. I tested them in another machine. However, I found some documentation for this mainboard, and it seems to be that the used VIO chipset has some limitations. You can use only 4 MB memory modules in the first two slots. 8 or 16 MB modules can be used only in the third slot. So these two memory modules are recognized only as 4 MB each when used in the first two slots, making only 8 MB altogether. One solution would be to put one of the memory modules into the third slot instead and leave one module out, but then we would only have 8 MB of memory. This should be sufficient for this machine, but I have here one 16 MB memory module, which I'll use instead, because why not? Another odd issue is that the BIOS recognizes the 3.5 inch floppy drive A as 5.25 inch floppy drive B when connected properly. This is strange, but when I just connect the floppy drive to the other connector, it is detected as 3.5 inch floppy drive A instead. Anyway, it seems to work reliably like that. Next problem is this Western Digital Hard Drive. 
It seems to work on another machine without an issue, but this machine seems to have a problem with it. Auto detection doesn't see the hard drive, and when I set it manually, the machine doesn't want to pause at all. So I'll try another hard drive. This corner 250 megabytes will hopefully do the job. And indeed, the machine could now boot into DOS. And here you can see the system information as it is running now. We have the SX33 CPU, 16 megabytes of RAM, 240 megabytes hard drive, and a 3.5 inch floppy drive. Time to take care of the broken standoffs on the front panel. The parts, which I found flying in the case, I'll glue them back with epoxy glue. broken off and lost edge of a holder, I print it on the 3D printer and glue it to the front panel in the same way. Yeah, this didn't work so well. The printed parts seem to be too small to stick properly, so I printed another one with a longer edge. This time, the front panel remains in place. This connector looks like a floppy power connector, but it is for the front LEDs. On the back of the case, the slot covers are held in place by a metal brace, like this one. Fortunately, the other one got lost, so I printed a new brace again on the 3D printer. Now it is time to get back to my main aim. I'd like to make a retro gaming PC out of this AT&T office machine. The installed 486SX33 is not ideal for this, so I'll replace it by an Intel 486DX266 with active cooler. This should give some extra power whenever needed. The 486SX33 and the DX266 are both running with the same frontside bus of 33 MHz. So I had only to switch one jumper from SX to DX. And here we go, the DX2 is running and properly detected. However, in the benchmark we can see a small bummer. This computer performs at 128 points and I know that a machine with a second level cache and same CPU and chipset performs at around 144 points, so we clearly can see the performance impact as a result of missing second level cache. Anyway, on the good side, look at the results of the landmark tests. In video, we are getting almost 12,500 points. This is a clear indicator that the video adapter is bound to the CPU by a VESA local bus, because due to ISA bandwidth limitations, we would get maximum 5000 points with a fastest ISA graphics adapter. For gaming, this value is even more important than the level 2 cache. However, it would be nice to have both, but it's almost impossible to find such a proprietary cache extension card for this board. Here again, you can see that the memory I.O. performance test indicates that there is only 8 KB large level 1 cache in this machine. The performance falls drastically as soon as 8 KB limit is reached. A little bit aside of theory, let's see how it performs in the games. As you can see, Doom is quite playable, even if it would run up to 20% faster with level 2 cache. However, with Quake, this machine has to struggle a lot. And with average frame rate of 5 FPS at the lowest resolution, it is definitely not playable at all. But keep in mind that Quake was never made for a 486 anyway, and even level 2 cache wouldn't help much here. Okay, we have a good base now. Let's add some goodies. 
first a network card to simplify the process of copying even more games and stuff into the machine. This is a fast and reliable 10 megabit per second Intel network adapter. And what is a gaming machine without a proper sound, right? Here we go with a Creative Sound Blaster 16. It only has the Creative CQM FM sound instead of original Yamaha OPL3, but still it has a good sound and very good compatibility it does. And finally, let's have some fun. <laughs> Okay, that looks good. The machine is back to life and I am pretty satisfied with the result. It has some scars of time, but it is a nice and clean machine now. The keyboard is like new and is not disgusting anymore. The mainboard works stable. It accepts our DX2 CPU and 16 MB of RAM. By the way, the mainboard is the same as FIC 486 GAC2 and was probably made for AT&T as well. I made a BIOS update of camera and even Y2K problem has gone. The very fast Cyrus Logic graphics adapter is wired through VLB and is superb for retro gaming. One bomber is missing level 2 cache and unfortunately it is not easy to find an appropriate cache extension card. I saw this one on eBay, but even if it would fit electrically, it is just too high because the height is limited by the floppy drive above the slot. So. I guess this is something I have to live with. Still, for the proper parts like the network card and the creative sound blaster, this machine makes a lot of fun and turned out to be not just grey office box but a very nice retro gaming PC. And this is it for me. I hope you enjoyed this restoration video. Please leave your feedback, likes or dislikes below and I hope to have you on my channel again. Thank you and goodbye.